morning second service. Um, we just want to welcome you in. If it's your first time, we always start with just a time of just prayer and worship. Um, if you are a father in the room today, happy Father's Day. Um, we want to take today and just celebrate you as well. So um, if y'all want to stand, we're going to pray and then sing some worship songs. Lord, just thank you for this time. Um, Lord, we just pray that this will just truly be a time of just lifting you up. Lord, that we'll just be able to push all distractions aside and truly just focus on you. Lord, we know that you're already here. We just thank you for first service and just the sweet spirit that was here, Lord. And we just pray you continue to move. We continue to do your wonders, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that we'll just be open just to receive what you have for us this morning, Lord. And um, I just pray that again, that this will just truly just be a time of worship and just lifting you up. So we just love you and praise you and just know pray.
proclaim that this morning. That you truly are a way maker, Lord. That even in the times where we just don't see it, we don't expect it. You're still working, you're still moving, you're still doing wonders, Lord. So Lord, I just pray that this morning that we just proclaim that. Lord, we'll just lift you up. Truly just acknowledge who you are in your heart for us. We just love you and praise you.
together as a family. And Lord, just sing these truths about you. And Lord, I just pray that we do just understand that you are still moving, you are still speaking, you are still working. You're the same God as you've always been, Lord. So Lord, I just pray as we continue to worship, as we just get into the word that we just lift you up. Just continue to just sing you praise, Lord. We just pray over Chris, Lord, as he just gets into the word, Lord. And I just pray that you just speak through him, that you just use him. Lord, I just pray that you speak to us, that we just have open hearts and open ears just to receive what you have. And we just love you and praise you. We just know pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, if you all want to turn and say good morning to someone. Um, and say happy Father's Day to a father. <laughs>
whether you can play golf or not, because I'm going to get all Happy Gilmore out there. And I want you to be there with me. So this is just a great way to honor your pops. Uh, the man actually was good at golf, and he loved it. It was one of his favorite things to do. And so it's just a really cool opportunity. So um, join us. It'll be thoroughly entertaining if you're in our foursome. Uh, just so you know, because Christian can play guitar, but he can't play golf either. <laughs> no. Yeah. That, that's true. You come to that? <laughs> we'll, we'll let you know. I'll let Larry know. Um, but yeah, if, you, if anyone is interested in something like that, you can just email me. Let me know. My email is christianm at rootschurch.co. Um, but yeah, I'll get your information forwarded to them. And then if we get some details, we'll kind of announce it. So yeah, but definitely come at least to watch me and Chris play golf. That would be entertaining. Um, and then we have a couple announcements. going to welcome Alina up and Kelly for some Guatemala trip announcements. Hey guys, good morning. That's so funny, we match. Um, so we are going to Guatemala again. I don't know who was here last summer, but we got to go for the first time as a team. She went before that, but um, I'm Alina. This is Kelly. Um, anyway, we are so excited to go back. Uh, we are hoping to build two houses. So what that looks like is we basically fund the house builds uh, with your help and um, for that, we need $3,500 a house. And it's cool because included in that, we're going to be building bunk beds. We're putting in stoves. And any excess also goes to, you know, like kitchen well, or kitchenware. Um, but yeah, just to be a blessing. Last year, um, the people that run the organization, they needed money for their truck. Their truck had been in the shop for like six months. And we had enough extra that went to their truck to get it back fixed and back in their hands, which is really cool. So it's really neat to see how God's moving, but we're so excited to go back. So we'll be going from July 20th to the 28th, and there's a team of 14 of us, um, 11 of which are Roots attendees. And so we're so excited um, to go back. It's going to be awesome. And um, yeah, great. <laughs> Yay, so stoked. Oh my gosh, this is like the fourth time. I don't know. We're doing this. It's so amazing. So um, if you guys weren't here last year, the houses that we build, like think more like sheds here. So it's not like we're building a mansion or anything, but they currently live on the dirt, like in nothing. So um, it's like, you know, just wood walls with the, but they have a door that locks and that's like, yeah, in a foundation with concrete, so it's not dirt. Um, but some ways you can support us, prayer, number one, is always the most important because as we get closer, it just feels like warfare comes stronger, you know? Um, just is. And there's a family coming with us, and we love them. So pray extra for the family. We love them. Um, and we have an event Saturday from 5 to 7 in the church in the park park. I don't know how to say it, but you know. Limbaugh. Limbaugh. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 5 to 7 at Limbaugh. Yep. That's the church um, or the park. And we'll be there with like a silent auction situation. And it's also online if you can't make it. And it's going to be simultaneous. So like the people online have a fair shot. It's not one way or the other. Um, yeah. And then we have a table today with a bunch of things from Guatemala that I brought back from my recent trip. So it's like from Guatemala, which is super fun. And little fun snacks from Guatemala that are like different and fun. So come back there and chat with us if you want to like learn more about the trip, or if you're interested on the online part of the silent auction, because we need to plug you into that group. Um, but yeah, we're super stoked, and we would love your prayers, and also just to chat. So we'll be at the table uh, for both services. So come hang out. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Let's pray for these guys. Um, we want to pray for the team, except for the three that don't go to Roots. Uh, but we'll, we'll pray for... We'll pray for... Oh, okay. We'll include your dad. So except for the two... Um, we're going to pray for everyone else. Uh, just kidding. We're going to pray for the team and just uh, always such a blessing to be able to partner with what the Lord's doing um, and, and a real easy way to be the hands and feet of Jesus and with $3,500 a house. Um, and again, I know um, not our idea of a house, but a huge blessing to these families um, getting to and really just praying for the team um, being sensitive in these trips. Like you have to be organized. You have to have a schedule and a calendar, and yet really being sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is doing, those conversations, those opportunities for prayer. And so we'll pray for just that. Hey, what's up, man? It's good to see you. 
Um, you know, I haven't seen everybody in so long. It's so good to see your faces. So, Lord, we thank you for this team. We thank you for what you um, have done through them, Lord, in this uh, partnership and, and relationship that you've opened in Guatemala. And we pray for this team, a growing team, Lord, this, this year going down. And so we just pray, Lord, for um, provision for their every need. Um, any overage, uh, Lord, is just going to go to bless them more. Again, getting to even fix their truck last year um, so that they could continue uh, being your hands and feet. So we pray for the team. We pray for unity. Lord, we pray for protection. And we pray for your leading and guiding, that they would just really be yielded to what you want to do in their hearts, um, but also in and through them as they make their way to Guatemala. Would you be preparing the hearts uh, of those that you're going to um, provide the privilege of ministering to? And so, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Awesome. Love you guys. And for our last announcement, I'm going to welcome Ginger back up to the stage to talk about our new gardening ministry. Hi, guys. Um, if you weren't here last week, we're launching a ministry called Cultivate, and it's for growing vegetables or even other plants. I can talk onto that. But you guys surprise me, and I have to make a pivot because I cannot fit all of you at my house. So, so... We will be meeting at Britain Nursery. That is where I'm the um, uh, propagation manager, and I will give you a tour, and we have plenty of space, and I will tell you, you're in for a treat. So my, um, the owners of the business, they are also believers, and God is actually in our mission statement as a business. So I'm really excited to invite you there. So after the two services, once I collect all the emails, I'll send out an email blast with directions and what we need to bring. But if you weren't here last week, I have a table in the back, and Cultivate is all about, you know, growing food, sharing with neighbors. It's pretty remarkable when you're out in your front yard and people walk by and they, they ask you, what are you growing? And you just get into a conversation. And this actually happened to me just this week. And it's no coincidence that we just found out someone is stealing my flowers. <laughs> so, the, you know, the <laughs> that's right. So the flesh is like, Ugh. but the Holy Spirit tells you, they need Jesus. So this is why we're doing this. So if you have any questions, would like to know more, I'll be in the back. And I, I'm just so excited for all of you. I prayed for all of you. And we're going to do some amazing growing this year. So thank you. Thanks, Ginger. I know. I'm such a loud mouth. Um, all of Europe felt the same way. Um, and, uh, but just hearing the response, which is so cool. So like the, the gifts and the talents that the Lord has given each of us um, uh, to be able to really do anything unto the Lord. It was really neat talking with Ginger about like the witness in her neighborhood, just the conversations that the Lord opens up simply because of, um, you know, what her yard looks like. Now, we open up conversations because of what our yard looks like, but it's for totally different reasons. Um, uh, you can kind of see our house through the trees and the overgrowth. But um, with that, it's, so, it's such a blessing to be back. Um, thank you guys for your prayers um, over these last few weeks. Nicole and I were so blessed. We got to celebrate our 25-year wedding anniversary, which is... oh. Absolutely the grace of God. And so just having that uninterrupted time to really just thank the Lord for his grace and his mercy um, upon us, upon our marriage was incredible. But it's such a blessing to be back. We missed you guys um, greatly. And so we're excited to be back to worship um, and to, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus together. Amen. Um, and so it's, it's happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. Um, and it's a special privilege 
for me this morning um, to get to dedicate. We do baby dedications here. We don't do baby baptisms. We do baby dedications, and we see in 1 Samuel chapter 1 where Hannah dedicates Samuel unto the Lord. And so um, baptism, we get to, once we're saved, um, we get to choose to then take that step of obedience that the Lord has us do um, by being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But together as a church family, um, we get to dedicate Owen, Paul, Childs to the Lord this morning. And, and it's really special it's to get to do it on Father's Day. So happy first Father's Day. Um, son, <laughs> um, and um, also Aubrey's the one who made uh, me a father, um, and so it's pretty great. <laughs> um, I know that there are some verses that you wanted to maybe share this yeah, morning. I mean, I wasn't going to. Actually. Okay. <laughs> well, here, let me, let me. Yeah, come on. Look, we got all day, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's taking. It's good to be back. We'll be out of here by three, I promise. Thank <laughs> you. So this is just something we've been praying for Owen, and something we invite you guys to pray with him. And yeah, as we're dedicating him, obviously we're asking you guys, as our church family, to help point him to the Lord, help love him, help be an example to him. And so I feel like this, um, yeah, Paul's prayer in Philippians one just kind of sums up a lot of what we're praying and what we're, yeah, hoping for with, with Owen. So, um, this isn't my Bible, so I gotta, I gotta find it. It's probably highlighted and coffee spilled on it. Yeah. So here, here. I thank God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right, as it is right for me to think, think this of you, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in my defense of the confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of me with grace. And then, yeah, I'll read a couple more verses, sorry. <laughs> But it's good. for God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be, be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Um, and it really is. It's such a privilege to, um, again, I pray that, you know, I... I as you just shared, um, really, this has happened. I mean, as soon as you guys found out you're pregnant, they're dedicating this gift unto the Lord and dedicating him unto the Lord and praying over him and um, praying as we will raise him up in the way that he should go. And, um, but as, as, as believers, those of us that are in Christ by faith, um, I pray that you have dedicated your marriages. I pray that you have personally dedicated your lives. I pray that you have personally dedicated your children because um, it's really important, and that's what this whole thing is about. And so then we get to partner with one another and pray over one another and then come alongside one another as the church body, as the church family. Amen. And so uh, it's a privilege to pray over you, Owen, Paul, Childs, and we dedicate you unto the Lord. And we thank you. Oh, Lord, we thank you. And we just pray, Lord, protection and your favor and your blessing, Lord, and all that you have for this young man. We pray that he would come to know you at a young age, Lord, that he would dedicate his life personally to you when he chooses personally to place his faith and trust in you as his Savior and as his Lord. And so we pray that you would give us much wisdom on how to love and shepherd his heart and how to love and shepherd Corey and Aubrey. Lord, as a, a family, but also as a church family, Lord, as we love and serve you and grow in the grace and the knowledge of you, Lord Jesus, together. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And he didn't cry because Papa, believe it or not, is a little intense for this young man. Um, and, and so it can be a little, it, I can be a little much. I don't know if you've heard this. Give me a hug. Um, love you. Love, love you so much. Um, we're good? We're good.
We're good. We're good. We did it. Grounded people to follow me. Oh yeah, grounded youth. You you are um, you're not grounded. You get to go play kickball right now um, with Christian and the team. Um, and I think that's it. Oh my gosh, what a blessing to be back with you. Um, we're going to be continuing our series uh, in the book of Acts, um, picking up in Acts chapter 19 this morning. But as always, we're always going to be in the Word of God, and we're going to read the Word of God together aloud. If you need a Bible, please just raise your hand, and we will be glad to put a Bible in your hand. Um, and then uh, you can stand with me. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. And we're going to be reading verse 18 and 19 together. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. And we'll read together aloud. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the word of God, and God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have spoken, that you are speaking, and that this morning, Lord, and always you desire to speak to us through your word and minister to us by your spirit. And this morning is no exception. Lord, is why we gather together corporately and from house to house, Lord, as we um, share in the life of Christ together. And so I pray that we have come here expectant, Lord. We have come here in faith and that we would receive your word to us this morning by faith that your word would be mixed with faith and that your word would be established in our hearts and take root by your spirit. Lord, that we would continue to be changed as you mold us and shape us into your very image, Lord. And so we give you ourselves and we give you this time. We love you and we praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. It's in your name that we pray, amen. And amen, you can be seated. It's so good to be back again. It was such a blessing for Nicole and I, really just having that uninterrupted time together. It could have been anywhere. The fact that we got to travel to beautiful places we've never been was amazing. Um, and Nicole and I have had a bl the blessing of, of going to some pretty incredible places. And for those of us that live here in Colorado, well, we live in a pretty amazing place all of which provides an opportunity for us to be overwhelmed by God's grace and goodness in the incredible beauty of his creation. When we see God's creation, church, when we see his majesty, the mystery of his goodness, the universe, the stars, the mountains, the flowers of the field, our children, our grandchildren, his very image in one another, what this should be doing in our hearts, hopefully, is that it would cause us to be instantly and constantly in awe of the one over all of creation. Because the more in awe of God that I am and the work of his grace that he has done for you and I, the more alert I am, the more aware I am of what he's doing in the world around me, the more aware I am and of what he's done and what he's doing in my own life and in the lives of those around me. This is the posture that the Lord longs for you and I longs for his church to have this new and proper perspective that we now have through God's grace in our lives opening our eyes to the reality of God's goodness and grace in everything in overwhelming awe and reverence of God and the overwhelming humility and perspective that he brings by his grace as we continue our series in Acts this morning we see Paul's ministry continue in Ephesus God's grace and favor poured out, poured out, and poured out upon his church as the Lord continues to advance, advance his gospel of grace as he builds his church supernaturally. And as always, with great advancement, with great opportunity, comes great opposition. David Wilkerson said, often Satan will attack you to stop a great work for God. He will put enemies in league together to hinder your labors 
They will come against you in unison, trying to get discount the minister in order to stop the ministry. And we see this clearly in our text this morning. We've seen this throughout our series through the book of Acts. As we see a riot erupt in Ephesus in response to God's church advancing. As Matthew Henry said, Christ is hated because sin is loved. A few weeks ago, we started our look at the move of God in Ephesus. God using the Apostle Paul to share the fullness of God in Christ, the gospel of the Lord Jesus in this city, bringing salvation, provoking confession and repentance in those that believed. Christ was magnified. They saw clearly who Christ was, not his last name, his title, Jesus is the Christ, Messiah, Redeemer. Their hearts are open to the grace and goodness of God, and they are changed. God even using things we may not think he would for his glory, and isn't that just like God? Church, there are going to be many things throughout our lives that don't make sense, but these two are opportunities for God to be glorified. God isn't distant. God isn't uninvolved. We learn quite the opposite from him himself through his word, learning of the sovereignty of God in and over and through all things. And one of the greatest witnesses that you and I can have as his children, as the children of God, is to acknowledge God in everything, even in the things that don't make sense, even in our difficulties, as we cling to and glorify God in and through it all. Everything, an opportunity for the Lord to be glorified as he works out his will in your life and in mine. The good, the bad, even the ugly are his workroom of grace. Do we understand this? This is the posture that God longs for you and I, longs for his church to have. This is the posture that God longs for you and I to believe and receive and understand. And this is the humble posture and perspective his spirit brings within those of us in Christ. God, by his grace, through his word, by his spirit, longing to open our hearts and our minds and our eyes afresh, even now this morning, wide open to this reality, the reality of his gospel, wide open to his goodness and his grace in all things. This morning we see a riot break out in Ephesus, a riot instigated against Paul and the infant church there because of the movement of the gospel. And although we'll see Paul was not at the center of the action, it must have been an unforgettable and frightening experience. Riots can do that, especially when they want to kill you. He may have been referring to this when he told the Corinthians how he had fought with wild beasts at Ephesus in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. Paul figuratively referring to this mob that he's about to face. Paul may have been remembering this spiritual opposition in Ephesus when he told the church in Corinth, for we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even to life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope. Beautiful. These are strong words from Paul, and we see the level of opposition and discouragement that they faced. We see in a very real sense this spiritual opposition again and again against the things of God. And we see it in Ephesus, and we see it and experience in a very real way in our world today. Sometimes we can feel burdened beyond our own strength. But Paul reminds us, That this is so that we would not trust in ourselves, but that we would trust in God. When things don't make sense to us, when we feel burdened beyond our strength, we trust in God in whom we have set our faith and our hope. I love the example of gospel humility that we see in the Apostle Paul. Like, consider that these are the words of a great man of faith, 
with all of his gifts and with all of his theological understanding, a man numbered among the apostles, you would think he had a heart so filled with the hope of the gospel, so filled with confidence in God that he never experienced a moment of doubt or fear. But hear his humble words, church. Not only is he confessing to fear and despair, but to the temptation and tendency of being self-reliant. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even to life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope. He's confessing the need for God to show him yet again that his hope cannot be in himself, but only in God. And further, that he is still in need of the help of others and the prayer of others. I love what Paul David Tripp says about this portion of text. He says, in this way, Paul is not painting a painting we look at and wish that we could be like, but rather he's a window to the awesome rescuing grace of the Redeemer. The Lord desires to produce and provoke this same humility in you and I in his church, that you and I would be a window to the awesome rescuing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ as we allow God to remind us again and again that our hope cannot be in ourselves, in our own strength, in our own abilities, but only in God. And further, that we deeply need the help and the prayer of one another in each other's lives. Amen? Something beautiful about humility is that humility produces worship of God instead of the pride and worship of self or man. Whether in the Apostle Paul or in you or in me, God desires to produce this same humility and perspective, church. That we too may be humble servants and leaders in the kingdom of God. That you and I would be a window to the awesome rescuing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we be a church, a people marked by humility and grace. Oh, it's my deepest desire, Lord. In me, in us, a window to the awesome rescuing grace of the Redeemer for all to see. We pick up in Acts 19, verse 21. It says, when these things were accomplished... What things? What's Paul talking about? Everything we've been reading through chapter 19. Great things. God has moved supernaturally in Ephesus through the preaching of the word of God and through discipleship. So that all who dwelt in Asia, it says, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. That was back in verse 10. Many coming to know the Lord. The Lord working unusual miracles through Paul. He even used some counterfeit exorcists. Again, God will use anything and everything everything for his glory. The name of the Lord Jesus is being magnified, bringing about confession and repentance, as we saw in verse 17. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds and burning their books. They're like, yo, I have got to get right with God because God is real. And so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And when these things were accomplished, Paul says, Paul purposed in the spirit, when, or Luke says, pardon me, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And God is moving in Ephesus, the word of the Lord growing mightily and prevailing. Paul's deciding where he should go next by the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. Paul purposed in the spirit that it was time for him to pass through these regions in Greece, in Macedonia, in Achaia, on his way to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. From Jerusalem, he will then go on to Rome. Now, how Paul gets to Rome, well, I don't think it's quite how he had anticipated, and we'll get into that later. Again, God moving in ways we wouldn't ask or think, but he decides that he's going to first go back and visit the churches in Greece. Then he's going to head to Jerusalem. Verse 22 says, so he went into Macedonia Two of those who, with two of those he sent into Macedonia, two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. Paul sends two of his friends and fellow laborers. 
Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia and says, I'm coming your way. It's interesting because we last saw Timothy in Acts chapter 18 when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia to minister with Paul in Corinth. Erastus is believed to have been the city director in Corinth. Commentators are divided on whether the Erastus who ministered in Macedonia was the same Erastus who was the city director in Corinth, but this seems to make sense to me, and, and that perhaps while ministering in Corinth, he got saved, and so by this time, it appears that Erastus has joined the mission of the church, and Paul sends for Timothy and him, and here's where things start getting crazy, verse 23, and about the time there arose a great commotion about the way. When the work was going so well, the word of the Lord growing and expanding, the church growing and expanding, Paul is thinking about leaving Ephesus, yet another commotion arises. The opposition flares up. Verse 24 and 25, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines to Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, men... You know that we have our prosperity by this trade. The city's now in turmoil because so many people have come to Christ as their Savior that it is now having an impact on the local economy. People are losing money because people are getting saved. Specifically, the people making money off of immorality and idolatry, specifically the temple of Diana and these shrines. Because people are getting saved, these false idols are not being purchased and worshipped as much in Ephesus and throughout Asia. So the people that make these false idols are upset. This certain man, Demetrius, the silversmith and other in the trade, are making a lot of money off this pagan temple and pagan worship and the business that it brings. Now, if you want to mess with people, mess with their money. A lot of people are okay with Jesus until Jesus starts affecting their business and resources. I mean, heck, that was the biggest thing that affected me. I was like, I can't go into the ministry. There's no money in that. <laughs> like, I, I want to pay my bills. and I like having a roof over my head. That's what's happening here in Ephesus. So many people are coming to know Christ as their Savior, that it's affecting their pagan temple and idolatry business. Their businesses, their resources are affected, and they're not happy. Think about it in our own society or city, where so many people got saved, God touching a city in such a way that the people that make money off of wickedness, they no longer do. There's no longer a demand for them. God desires to have this sort of effect upon us and our society, stirring things up in a good way. As the light shines into and destroys the darkness, the Lord turning the world right side up <laughs> through his church. Now, Paul wasn't campaigning to close down the temple of Diana. He just did the Lord's work. He wasn't picketing the temple of Diana or staging anti-idolatry rallies. No, he simply taught the truth. He taught and preached the word of God and he lived it out. And as more and more believed, more and more witnessing to the lost, the word of the Lord grew mightily. Christ was magnified. God took more ground from Satan in Ephesus and the result was that less and less people were consumed by immorality and idolatry. This is a proper place for the church to use political means. Using the rights and privileges afforded us. Our beliefs will affect how we vote, for instance. I mean, it should affect every aspect of our lives. But church, our main focus should be to demonstrate by our godly lives the truth of the gospel. To proclaim the gospel verbally, as people get saved, the culture will be changed. Pastor Christian teaching these last couple weeks on Romans 12, the Lord through the Apostle Paul teaching us that our lives are living sacrifices. We're to serve the Lord with our spiritual gifts, and we are to be leavers, right? We're to be Christians, behave like Christians. Christian literally meaning Christ-like. And in Romans 12, verse 9 through 21, we read, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence. 
fervent in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Huh. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as demands depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will reap coals, heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Incredible. Our testimony isn't just our story, church. It's our lives and our actions. It's the witness of the way that you and I live and walk through this life. The Spirit of God, through the Word of God, in the people of God, reaching the lost. This is how God reconciles and is reconciling the world to himself. You want to know what is happening when we look around and we see the madness that we see? Don't miss it. God is is reconciling everything in heaven and earth unto himself. And it doesn't matter who the president is or isn't. I assure you. And nothing is going to stop him. Jesus is building his church. And the prophetic fulfillment of that promise from Jesus himself is happening even right here, right now, this morning, in a cafeteria in Monument, Colorado. As people came to Jesus, they naturally stopped worshiping Diana, buying shrines associated with the temple. In Ephesus, business was down. This happens again and again as Jesus does his work. Verse 26, moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not just in Ephesus, this thing is spreading beautifully throughout Asia. The gospel is going forth. The gospel convincing people of the reality that if it's man-made, it's not of God. If man can build it, it's not of God. So not only is this trade of ours in danger, verse 27, of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. So not only are people buying these shrines and these trinkets, they're coming to this temple in Ephesus, this temple of Diana to worship. This was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world and was famous throughout the world. No matter how immoral the worship of this sex goddess was. And we know this. When there's an attraction in a local city, it helps the local economy. In Ephesus, it wasn't the boot barn or lollies or a new amphitheater. It was the temple of Diana. People came from all over to, to, to practice false worship and pagan idolatry. Demetrius and the other silversmiths are promoting this. Paul is promoting the one true God and pointing people to purity and cleansing through the grace of God. The reality is that Demetrius and these silversmiths are not concerned about the people as much as I believe they were concerned about their money and their jobs. What we see happening in Ephesus is the power of the gospel. It's the power of Christ. When people came to know Christ, they were no longer interested in pagan temples and pagan worship. The same is true today for you and I. When we come to know Christ, our focus, our interests, our time, our resources, everything, what we do changes. We, we're no longer interested in the same things that we once were. We no longer live or behave as the world or as we once did. Everything else pales in comparison to the grace and the love of God. Everything comes into perspective in light of the cross. Everything comes into perspective in light of the grace and the goodness of God, the incredible reality that we have been saved by grace and reconciled from sin and death. 
The things we once pursued, seeking pleasure, seeking self, seeking fulfillment, seeking identity, we no longer do. Because we realize that all of these things pale in comparison to Christ. Our true identity, our true purpose finally found. When we come to Christ and Christ is magnified in your life and in mine as he should be, he brings this clarity, he brings per perspective, he brings change. Because the more in awe I am of God and the work of grace that he has done, the more alert I am. The more aware I am of what he's doing in my life, in the lives of those around me, God working out his grace in you and in me. This is the posture that the Lord longs for you and I, for the church to have. This is the posture that God longs for you and I to walk in and operate from. Verse 28 says, Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. Again, we see Paul has others faithfully serving with him in the ministry. The city is in an uproar, and they can't find Paul, so they grab his boys. I try to imagine if I had been invited by Paul on one of his missionary journeys... I think a part of me would be excited and a part of me would have been horrified and said thanks, but no thanks. Knowing I'd better be prepared to be beaten and thrown in prison. Verse 30, and when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. And some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. So Paul's concerned about the life of his friends. He's ready to jump into all of this craziness. But the disciples, some of the officials that were Paul's friends, won't let him. They protect him from this melee. Some therefore cried one thing, verse 32, and some another, for the assembly was confused. And most of them did not know why they had come together. So here's this riot that's taking place. Obviously people are upset, but they're so caught up in the emotion of it all, they don't even know why. This happens all the time. Sometimes we find ourselves so caught up in our emotions, we're so worked up. You ever find yourself in that place where you're like so irate and worked up and you don't even know exactly why? This is happening all the time. It seems like this is happening currently all over in our culture. Everybody is worked up about everything. Could you imagine? Oh, could you imagine if the church was worked up about living and proclaiming the gospel? Could you imagine if the church was worked up about Jesus? Could you imagine if the church was worked up about glorifying God in everything? Moved and compelled by the mission and the mandate that God has given us. Won't he do it? And so they drew Alexander out of the multitude. Verse 33, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. That would have been quite the sight. You could have heard it. These, these words echoing from the masses. The Jews would normally be blamed for the problems in Ephesus. And even when they weren't responsible, they were frequently the scapegoats. And so the Jews send their spokesperson, which is Alexander. And he's wanting to make sure that the mob knew that the Jews did not approve of Paul either. But when they found out Alexander was a Jew, they won't have it. They don't want to hear from him. And then with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. I love what David Guzik says on this. Think how this echoes to our own time. To see the strangeness of our world. People say today in their own words and their actions, their time and their dollars spent, great is my sports team. Great is my political party. Great is the consumer economy. Great is internet porn. Great is material wealth. Great is getting drunk or getting high. And yet if one says great is the Lord Jesus Christ, they are regarded by many as strange. For all the supposed greatness 
of Diana of the Ephesians, no one worships her today. Yet there are millions and millions today who live and worship Jesus Christ and who would willingly die for him. The truth is, idols and false gods have an expiration date. But Jesus of Nazareth lives forever. What are our words, what are our actions, our, our time and our dollars spent saying? What is the witness of our lives, honestly? Personalize this. Ask yourself these questions honestly, prayerfully. Our lives and our witness, not just our mouths, say, great is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And when the clerk, the city clerk had quieted the crowd, verse 35, he said, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here, who are neither robbers or temples, nor blasphemers of your goddess. City clerk is not really the best title, I think, in this verse. He's really more like the mayor. He is appointed by the Roman governor. He has great authority, and so he stands up and he calms the crowd down. And he actually gives some pretty good advice. Calm down, be quiet, and do nothing rashly. Bringing truth into this situation and calming the multitudes. And we see, verse 38, Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called into question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. This is God's hand of protection over Paul and his co-laborers here at the church in Ephesus. This riot is huge. People are angry and emotional. And one guy stands up in it all and calms everybody down. We see that the devil was at work in Ephesus, but guess what? So was God. Church, the same is true today. The devil is at work, but guess what? So is God. Don't miss it. Don't miss what God is doing, what he desires to do. Don't miss out on what God is trying to do in you personally, in me personally. Even though things don't always make sense, sometimes our life feels like a riot. We see in Acts 19 how the gospel stirred up an entire city. The city of Ephesus was a wicked city that desperately needed God's touch, much like every city in our country and the world today. Just like Ephesus, we can see the work of Satan all around us. Ah, it can be so discouraging, can it? Just turning on the news or reading the newspaper. But don't let it distract you, church. God is always at work. God is at work today and always. Sometimes we can feel burdened beyond our own strength. That's of the Lord. Paul is reminding us here, and it's just a, yet another example. This is so that we would trust in God and not ourselves. When things don't make sense to us, when we feel burdened beyond our own strength, we trust in God in whom we have set our hope, roots, church. God is at work today and always. God is seeking and saving his people every day. God is stirring up individuals. God is stirring up families. God is stirring up cities. And God is building his church and nothing's going to stop him. And God wants us to know and be encouraged this morning in the truth of this. You're not alive in this generation on accident. Abandon your life to him wholly today. Serve him faithfully today. You will never regret it. Now is the time, church. Today is the day. The more in awe we are of God, his gospel, his goodness, his grace, the more we are aware of what he's doing, the more aware we are of what he's doing in our own lives, 
the more aware we are of what he's doing in the lives of those around us and in his church. This is the posture that the Lord longs for you and I, his church, to have. This new and proper perspective that we now have through God's grace in our lives, opening our eyes to the reality of God's goodness and grace, his gospel in all things, even in the chaos around us, even the things that don't make sense. There's a lot of things Satan is using to distract us from God, his goodness and his grace, his gospel, his plans, his purposes. We may not be worshiping shrines to some sex goddess in some pagan temple, but Satan is still distracting and stumbling many through false worship and idolatry, false perspectives and lies, bringing confusion and lack of clarity. But Jesus saves us from sin and death. And while we're still given today, he saves us from ourselves. Many are the pitfalls of making yourself the center of your world and your existence rather than making Christ the center, the anchor and the focus of your life. Church, what we have in Christ goes so far beyond anything that we can fully comprehend. What better way to close out this morning then with the Apostle Paul's prayer over this exact church in his letter to them that he wrote probably about four or five years later, probably during his imprisonment in Rome. Verses that we study during our series through the book of Ephesians. The worship team is going to come up and we're going to wrap things up. Oh, it's so good to be home. <laughs> it's so good to be in the we and to be together with you, Roots Church. <laughs> These are the same prayers that I pray over you and your families and your marriages and your children and this precious fellowship that Jesus is building. He says in Ephesians 1, verse 15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace and your goodness. We thank you for the glorious gospel. Jesus, we thank you for your life, your death, your burial, and your resurrection. I see you and your grace and your goodness all around me. I see it in everything. <laughs> I look at my own life and I see it. I look at my wife and I see it. I look at my daughters and I see it. I look at my grandsons and I see it, Lord. I look at your creation and I see it. And I look at Roots Church and I see it. Even in the sorrow, the hurt, and all the things I don't understand, I see it. And I'm in awe of you, Lord your overwhelming grace and goodness. And so, Lord, we just acknowledge you, your grace, the gospel here this morning. God, would you quiet our minds and still our hearts upon truth. We rejoice in truth. Oh, it's only the truth that can set you free. And if you haven't been set free by the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ here this morning, I pray that you personally would choose today to be set free. Jesus has done everything. 
everything necessary, everything needed to you, for you to experience life. Not just, not just existence, life. It's a Greek word, zoe. It's a life of abundance. It's a life that is eternal. And it is a life that is only accessible through Christ and his finished work. When you and I choose to believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths, placing our faith and trust in Christ and his finished work, God tells us in his word that we shall be saved. So if that's you this morning, you can simply pray, Lord Jesus, I want, I want that life. <laughs> I don't want to just exist. I want you, Jesus. God, we thank you. I'm overwhelmed by your grace. God, and we pray. We pray that you would help us, that you would forgive us, that you would uh, allow us to walk in this, Lord, to live this and share this with everyone we possibly can. God, we pray for this community that you have called us to, that you would continue to draw many by your word and by your spirit. Give you ourselves in this time, even as we respond in worship. God, would you be glorified? Would you help us to walk in you as we walk out these doors? We love you and praise you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen and amen. I know that Landon will share as he always does, but there's always pastors and leaders and brothers and sisters in Christ that are here this morning to pray. If we can pray with you or pray for you, if you have questions for my wife or myself, um, we've got, uh, again, we're all here. Um, would love to meet you if we haven't had a chance to meet you, but let's worship. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> if you all want to stand, we're going to sing one more song. Oh, sins.
up front and to the side if y'all need any prayer, but other than that, have a great your weekend and happy Father's Day. Praise the Father.